right, so two classes ago, again, we talked about continuity. And for continuity, we have to have that the function is defined. <coughs> is defined at the point at which we're considered. We have to have that the overall limit exists, which means we have to check the left and right hand limit. Make sure that they're the same. And then we have to have that those two values are equal. So really that third step kind of sums up the entire thing that we need. These are the pieces that we need. Okay. Now <coughs> make sure anytime that you are dealing with this continuity that you're showing whether or not a function is continuous, that you are organized with your work and you show all three pieces. Now, if it's not continuous, the second that you find it fails on these steps, you can stop. You don't have to keep moving on because you've shown it's not continuous. So let's go to this one. First of all, we see that this is a piecewise with three different pieces. Uh, for my top part here, this is going to be the left part of my function because x is less than one. This is actually at the function and this is the right part. This should help out with finding the function value or the acting limit in our right hand. All right, so let's start off with our function value. So we want to make sure that it's continuous at that point at which uh, the function changes uh, expression to change its graphs. So I'm looking at one. We see our function is defined at one. All right, so now because it is a different graph for the left hand and the right hand limit, we need to do it individually. So I'm going to go ahead and check my left hand limit. The limit as x approaches 1 from the left f of x. Make sure you write limit notation and that you refer to the function itself. If you just write limit yourself, that's the proper notation. Alright, so limit as x approaches 1 from the left. So that means we're using this first one right here. As x approaches 1 from the left, three x minus 1. We do direct substitution, we get 3 minus 1, which is 2. Ooh, that's exciting. So right now at this point, even though we haven't figured out the overall limit, can we make a conclusion based upon continuity? Yeah, my left hand limit does not equal the function value. In order for the overall limit to equal the function value, they have to be the same. So right here I can say limit as x approaches 1 from the left does not equal the function value. Therefore, f of x is not continuous. <coughs> Questions with that? <coughs> now suppose that this worked out great, that awesome, so you want, we would check our right hand limit. And again, we would have to specify which function we're dealing with. So we'd say of f of x, we would rewrite that describing which branch we're working with, which is negative 4 x plus 5. We can insert that. Then you say which overall limit is, and then you say what about So just make sure you are hitting each of these three things through whether or not it's continuous. Okay. <coughs> now the other one was finding k so that it would make it continuous. We see that the point in question is going to be at negative 3. You can see right away what is happening on your graph at negative 3. Okay, I heard variant answers there. What is happening at negative 3? A hole. Okay, so possible I to a possible hole. When we go ahead and factor the top, this is the top factor in 2. x plus 4, x plus 3. And that's what lets us know since those who would reduce that is a hole. Okay. So we know that that is a hole at that spot. Uh, <clears throat> now we have I, or sorry, k in both places. So we just need to make sure that that hole is filled. So we need to find the k value that will fill in that hole um, and make the function that will match. OK, let's go ahead and start off. We want to make sure it is defined so f, of, oops, f of negative 3. Just kidding, right? We don't know what that is yet, but it is defined. All right, now we need to check our left hand limit and right hand limit. So the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left of f of x. 
Now for this piecewise function, we have kind of a different aspect than our last piecewise function in that we are using the same graph for both the left hand and the right hand, which is awesome. So our overall limit is actually going to be using this one. All right. Now let's go ahead and write this in its simplified form. Uh, you know what? Since it is doing the same thing for both the left and right hand limit, since it's going to be the same for the overall limit, I'm just going to do the overall limit. We can do individual ones, but since we know it's going to be that same branch there, um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so let's go to their simplified form. So the limit as x approaches negative three, and so that would be x plus four over k. So let's take negative three and put it in, and that's going to give us. <coughs> over k. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. So our third thing is that we need f of negative equal our overall. Okay, so we just fill in the piece that we have here. F of negative 3 was K. And we want this, right? So we're going to specify that we want this. We don't know that that's the case yet. We're trying to find the K value that makes that true. So we want for those two to be equal. Alright, so I have K equals 1 over K. Alright, multiply both sides by K, so I get K squared equals 1. We saw we get k equals plus or minus. So we actually have two k values at the point. All right, any questions with that? <coughs> so again, with continuity, make sure you're going through each of those three steps. First is the function of nine. Second, check left, right, overall limit. Third, do those functions. Okay, <coughs> let's go ahead and take a look at our homework. Um, I want you to actually, everyone, turn to the intermediate value there in front of your homework. So on the video, I went ahead and did a couple of those problems on your homework with the intermediate value theorem. I just want to recap that, kind of touch base with that. And I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, my key where it's all written out. <clears throat> Again, we have a continuous function. And if our function is continuous, then so the Leyland's terms of what's happening here is that if our function is continuous, then it must set all the y values um, from our lowest endpoint to our highest endpoint. And when it hits that, the x value must fall within the range of our x interval. So for any y value that gets it, so let's say I just want to go for this point here we can see that that's going to fall within our x interval. So because it's continuous, it's going to take on all those y values between the endpoints, and where that occurs has to fall within our x interval. So again, for any intermediate <coughs> theorem, I found that the easiest way to go about this is just to check the conditions and then make your conclusion. So our conditions is that it has to be continuous. That's a big If it's not continuous, you can't apply an intermediate value there. It might have a, a value that matches up the information, but it's not guaranteed. Has to be continuous, which is guaranteed. So check that's continuous. All polynomials are continuous. Um, absolute values are continuous. If you have one that has a point of discontinuity, for example, number 12, we have a vertical asymptote <coughs> at x equal to 1. But as long as it's continuous on the interval, we're fine. So you can see that x equal to 1 is not within my interval, so that's fine. We don't have a discontinuity within the interval we're checking. It's continuous on the interval, just make sure you specify it's continuous on the interval. All right, so our function is continuous. Then you just have to check that your endpoints are different so that there's actually some y values that it has to take on. And we need that information for applying the intermediate value theorem. So you just check your endpoint heights and make sure that the height in question, the one that we're interested in, is in between those. Okay, so you've got to specify that it actually falls within that range. If it doesn't fall between the y value heights, we can't guarantee it's going to fill up. Uh, all right, and then once you check those conditions, then we know intermediate value theorem applies. And again, for AP calc, this is one of the abbreviations you're allowed to use, IPT. All right, so by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a value, C, and make sure you specify where that value falls. That's always within our interval. So our, there exists a value, C, that falls within our interval, so specify that, where that value has the y value taken on. 
Okay, so this would be the same general statement that you make every single time. There's this value c within that interval such that f of c equals whatever it is we're interested in. Now, these questions had two parts. Here we applied the intermediate value theorem saying, hey, we know the value exists. And then the question asks you to take the direction to find that value. It's not always going to ask you to find the value, so just make sure you get the directions. If it asks you to find the value, then you're just actually setting up your equation and solving. We say, hey, a value exists. And they say, all right, we'll find it. So we go ahead and take our equation, set it equal to the value of y that we know it's going to hit, and then just solve for x, y. Now you'll notice that we got x equals negative 4 and x equals 3. So there are two values there, but again, we only care about the interval. And so from 0 to 5, only one value falls within there. And so 3 would be our um, solution for that. <laughs> okay, before I take a look at the questions over there, are there any general questions with intermediate value here? Again, the idea is that if it's continuous, it's going to hit all those y values in between. And when it hits it, that's going to end up happening between the x values and y. Okay, so it looks like 11 and 12. So I'm going to go ahead and touch on those since we're here with intermediate value. So for 11, again, we have a polynomial, so we have its continuous. And then check your endpoints. We want f of 0, which we find is negative 2, and then f of 3, which we find is negative 2. Now the point that we are interested in is the y height of 4. Does 4 fall between here? Yes, indeed it does. So make sure you state that, and that's your third condition. So the height we're interested in falls between the heights of our endpoints. If that helps you out to draw a little graph, just a quick little sketch so you can see what's happening. We have the point 0, negative 2. And we have the point 3, 19. So we don't know what the function looks like, but it's definitely going to hit everything within there. Does it hit the height of 4? Does 4 fall within there? Yeah, 4 falls within there. So we know that intermediate value theorem applies. If that helps you out to visualize what's going on, by all means, go ahead and do that sketch. <coughs> okay. Since it's continuous, endpoints are different, and the height we are interested in falls in between, then we know by intermediate value theorem, there exists a c value. And we're going to say c because they said c. If they said find the k value, find the t value, then you just use whatever variable they're talking about. So there exists a c value within this interval where our c value has the y height of 4, so such that f of c. So you're kind of just spinning back to them with the k value. Then once again, to find c, we need to actually find the value which that occurs. So we take our function. It says, so we're finding when f of c equals 4. So we're taking our function, setting it equal to 4. Here you end up having to graph this when it was not factorable. And then when we graph it, we find there's just one, <coughs> one time in which this occurs, and that's f2. Make sure that falls within the interval. And it does, so we take that value. So Questions with number 11 there? So with the. Uh, um Finding the c value over on that side, mm -hmm. equal to, how did you solve that? Because I couldn't factor. Yeah, so that's why I said you have to use your calculator for this. We're not able to. Do it. If we didn't have the calculator, we'd have to do the rational root test. Do you guys remember those words? Remember what rational root test is? P is a t Yeah, so if you don't have your calculator, you do have to use the rational root test. But I don't know that I've seen them actually make you do that on the AP exam, typically. You never know what they might do. They might pull it out, uh, pull it out of their hats. But um, typically, if it's a non-factorable problem, they'll give you the calculator for it. But yeah, yeah, you needed your calculator. Other questions with number 11? Okay, so number 12, same idea. It is a rational function. Like I said, there is the discontinuity of a vertical asymptote, but that does not occur on our interval here, so we're good. So our function is continuous on the interval. We have to just check our endpoints. <laughs> and our endpoints, we get heights of 5, 5, 6, and 6 and 2 thirds. 6 falls in between those. OK, so our endpoints are different. And 6 falls in between our y heights. So thus, intermediate value here applies. So by IBT, there is a c value on this interval, so on that interval, such that f is c. So again, you kind of just spit back to them what they ask you about. You check the conditions and you say, conditions are met. So I know my c value on this interval meets this requirement here. All right, but then when we go to solve over here, <clears throat> we check when our rational function actually equals 6. Using cross multiplying, 
And we get, again, two answers, but only one of them falls within the interval. So we take just the C value of three. Now, again, it's possible to have more than one value. So if both values fall within the interval, you take both of them. But just make sure you double check them. Questions with number 12? Now, number 13 we did in class, and I have the wrong answer here because I forgot to fix it. What was it, like 0.215? Remember when I typed in my calculator, I didn't leave this. All right, so our answer is point. Okay. <clears throat> so again, same idea. Polynomial, so it's continuous. We're good with that. Checking our endpoints. They have different heights, negative 1 and 10. We are interested in whether or not it has a zero. And if it has a zero, that means our function equals zero. So we're just checking to see if it basically goes from negative positive or positive to negative. Does it cross that zero? So again, if it helps to draw a little sketch, do so. We have the point zero, negative one. And we have the point one, ten. Does our function <coughs> cross zero? Yes, indeed it does. So we know I need two points. Okay, so again, zero falls in between our y heights. So thus, intermediate value theorem says there exists a value c on this interval such that f of c equals zero. And again, we're checking that it equals zero because the question is asking us to show that it has a zero. And then since we know that's true, we go ahead and set up our function equal to zero. And again, this was another one that you did have to graph, but it was not factorable. <coughs> question 13. Um, go ahead and show me with thumbs how we feel about intermediate value theorem. I know it's kind of a weird thing, but show me with thumbs now that we've watched the video and done the homework. <clears throat> it sneaks its way back up throughout the rest of the year, so uh, just make sure you're refreshing your memory with it. We'll continue to just pull it back out in class every now and then, but they like to just randomly on a career spot so it enters the program. All right, let's take a look at number eight. So for this problem, we have a piecewise function, and we're supposed to decide whether or not it's continuous at zero, which makes sense because zero seems to be the part at which the function changes. Alright. So again, let's check our three things. Okay. So first of all, I need to have that the function is defined at zero, which is one. Alright. Next, I need to check my limit. Now, once again, this is going to be the same function that's being used for my left hand and right hand limit. So we can just do the overall limit here. Because left hand and right hand are going to give us that same result there. All right, so my overall limit as x approaches 0 of f of x. As x approaches 0. And let's see if we can factor something out. So on the top, I can factor out an x. I have x squared plus 3. On the bottom, I can factor out an x. So those are going to reduce. Because if I tried direct substitution right here, I would have gotten zero zero. Alright, so now when I do direct substitution on top I get three. At the bottom I get negative three. Alright. So then for my third thing, check to see if those are equal. As we can see, not quite. So we get f of zero. This is not equal. The limit as x approaches 0 of f of x. Therefore, f of x is not continuous with that x of the So once again, every time you're doing that continuity, check those three things. Make sure you're very methodical with it. <clears throat> Questions with that one? Hopefully, continuity is relatively familiar for you. Um, I don't know that you had to 
be very detailed with your contribution for, but the idea should be pretty similar to that. Right, any last minute questions on our topic? Okay, so today we're going to be talking about rates of change, um, tangent lines, average rate of change, instantaneous rate of change, or limit definition of the derivative, kind of what all that means. So we're going to do handwritten notes for that. So we're going to get out paper for that. And we have quite a few topics that we're covering today. So we have rates of change. Tangents limit that. Algebra one, you didn't realize you were doing calculus back in algebra one. <laughs> okay, so let's first talk about rates of change. I want you to turn the top of your shoulder partner real quick. What is a rate of change? What's an example of it? How do we find rates of change? Just real quick, we'll turn to your shoulder and discuss it. <laughs> Yeah. All right, go ahead and bring it back up front. Anybody want to volunteer what you discussed? What do you know about rates of change? It's the slope. It's the slope. Okay, good. Anything else? Okay, so rates of change is a slope. Would you guys agree it's the amount of change? over the time it takes, something along those lines, the amount of change over the time it takes. Um, we talked about it is slope. So in other words, change in y over change in x. You guys take those back. Now our variables aren't always y and x. Um, if we were talking about, let's say, our speed or our velocity, that's a rate, that's a rate of change. What is that rate of change? What is that change in what? So what is it? Velocity is the change Change in position over change in time? Yeah. Right, so velocity is our change in position. How many miles have you gone and how much time has elapsed? So you think about it, like going on Fairfax County Parkway, because we all abide by the law, 50 miles per hour. Right, it's 50 miles per hour, isn't it? Feels like it should be 60, then we're 60. So you're going it's 80. Uh, so miles per hour, change in that distance, miles is distance per hour over that change in time. Okay, so we have some variations on this. Um, slope, you can also think of it as rise over run. Um, and again, specifically, when we're dealing with, uh, we'll start off with our position function. So specifically when we're dealing with our position function. And for whatever reason, position is typically defined as x of t or s of t. I'm not really sure why. Anybody, you guys know why? Why not the empty? What's that? Ooh, why is it x? Because of yeah, that's absolutely sounds, sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right, so our position, which is often labeled as x of t or s of t, um, so that's our starting point. Now, like we just talked about, we can then go on to velocity, which is that change in position. 
or change in x of t over change in time. Again, an example of thing, miles per hour. Miles per hour, miles is talking about our distance, per hour talking about our time. And then from there, we also go on to acceleration. Which is going to be our change in velocity. Still over change in time. Uh, so here we end up having our time squared. So a lot of times it's usually measured as <coughs> meters per second squared. If you uh, think about like objects going with gravity. Raise your hand if you've taken this. this, 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 this. Okay. Anybody taking physics right now? That's awesome because that means you're going to be doing calculus and physics. It's, I think, one of the most beautiful things when you take calculus and physics together. Although, sadly, you guys don't have physics here. It's most wonderful when you take Cap A, B, and Physics, but that's okay. Uh, so you're going to be doing calculus in physics. The primers are going to say you're doing calculus in physics. All right, so these are all rates of change. Now, these aren't the only rates that we have. Um, we could talk about change in temperature or change in time. If you think about a cup of coffee cooling, um, <clears throat> we could talk about bacteria growing, how the rate of change that the bacteria growing over time. So these are not the only ones. These are probably just the most common ones that we use. Okay, so our rates of change, we have two, we're going to kind of break it up into two categories. We have our average rate of change. <coughs> average rate of change. And you'll hear me refer to this as A rock. Just for short. Please don't write A rock on the A gabriel. Um, so our average rate of change for an A rock. It's just our algebra one slope. It is the slope of the secant line. If we were to have the actual graph. And we'll take a look at what that means. So it's just our slope of the secant line or our algebra one slope, which means we're just subtracting our y's. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. <clears throat> it's our slope or our rate of change over an interval. This is over an interval. Okay, so this is not going to give us our exact rate of change at every single moment in time, but it can tell us um, our average over time. So, for example, let's just again think in terms of velocity. So, if I asked you for the average velocity, from time zero to time five. It's not giving you each individual velocity along the way, but it's telling you on average your velocity during that time. All right, now, <clears throat> what we are now going to look at in calculus is what's called instantaneous rate of change. Instantaneous rate of change. So this is what's going to be new for you. So average rate of change you were doing before with your algebra one slope. Instantaneous rate of change, which I'll refer to as IROC. This tells us our rate of change at an exact moment in time. This is our rate of change at an instant in time. So let's say you're driving along Fairfax County, you're going from here to, I don't know, Chuck E. Cheese or something. And you can get Fairfax County for that. No. Maybe you're driving on Gainesville to get to Chuck E. Cheese. So we're going to Chuck E. Cheese. And I can figure out going from here, starting, or let's say at one minute your speed, and let's say at 10 minutes your speed, I can find your average velocity there. But to find your exact velocity at four minutes and 53 seconds, um, we would have to know your instantaneous rate of change. So at that exact moment in time, what is your speed? What's your velocity at that point in time? All right. <clears throat> now our instantaneous rate of change is actually comes from our derivatives. We're going to deal a little bit with derivatives in our first unit here, and the next unit is full-blown derivatives. All right. So our instantaneous rate of change. This is the slope of the tangent.
at a particular point. So the slope of the change line had a point. is pretty synonymous with instantaneous or change or slope of the tangent line. So like, these are some key phrases here. You'll see that it asks for you to write the slope of the tangent line. It's going to ask you to write the equation of the tangent line. And as we know for an equation, we need this slope. So the slope of the tangent line, which is our instantaneous or change we're after. Okay. So before we go ahead and do some problems with this, let's take a look at what I'm talking about. Um, actually, let's first do an average rate of change problem. Just to remind ourselves of how to do algebra. Let's just do a real quick short example here. Find the average rate of change, find a graph of the function x cubed minus x on the interval 1 to 3. Find the average rate of change of that function on the interval with the curve. All right, so again, a rock is just our algebra one slope. So I want to do y minus y over x minus x. So it's f of 3 minus f of 1 over 3 minus 1. Are we all okay with that so far? It's just algebra one slope. They told us the interval. So these are the x values that we're using, and we're going to find our y values first time. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and off to the side so you support and find those. So let's do f of 3, which is 3 cubed minus 3. It's 3 cubed. So is that minus 3? Awesome. Alright, and then f of 1, 4 cubed minus 1. Ooh, 0. That's exciting. So again, average rate of change, it's just algebra one slope. Okay, so now let's talk about what I mean by the secant line versus the tangent line. Let's go and start off by drawing a D graph. Let's make it look something like this. Alright, and we'll say this is X. points on our graph, calling this x, and I'm calling this one x plus h, where h is just the distance away from x. Okay, so h is just this distance. Alright, and then we have our y values for f of x and f of x plus h. Now, our secant line, so I'm going to say again, a rock is our slope of our secant. Our secant line goes to those two points. If you think back to your glorious days of geometry with your wonderful geometry teacher, for circles, the secant line went through the circle and touched it at two points. Same idea. Our secant line is the graph of those two points. Okay, so do your best to draw the secant line through there. I'm going to try and get up here. Bear with me. As I can see. goes through those two points. And again, to find our slope, we 
times y minus y, so f of x plus h minus f of x over, and then <coughs> x minus x, x plus h. Okay, so this is our secret line. This little bit of it will give my average rate of change. We're going to get back to that in just a moment. Now, our tangent line, again, if you think back to geometry with your wonderful geometry teacher, tangent line hit the circle at just one point. Okay, so let's draw the tangent at x. So do your best to draw your tangent where it's only going to hit at one point. Okay, and this will give us our instantaneous rate of change. This is like a slope. Okay, so our blue line here, our change line, our slope is our instantaneous rate of change. At that exact moment, if I find the slope of this blue line here, that is the rate of change at that exact moment of x. Now you can see as we move along, so as I move along here, that slope is going to change, right? If I draw a little slope here, that slope is different than our slope. <clears throat> but the idea is that as we move along our function at any single point in time, we can stop, draw a little tangent line. The slope of that tangent line is our instantaneous rate of change, or our derivative. <clears throat> now the question is, how do we find this? We were able to find the slope of our secant line because we had two points on that line. Here we have just one point on the line. So what we do is actually use a limit with our secant line. So let's talk about this. If I move this, this point here closer and closer and closer, so let's move it here, you can see that our secant line is going to get closer and closer to our actual tangent line. So the closer those two points are, the more accurate, the more it's going to match up with our tangent line. So what we really want to have happen is that this distance here shrinks down to be nothing. So where this is getting closer, it's just closer. So as this distance approaches zero, then the secant line is going to be approaching the tangent line. And we represent that with the limit. Right? Limits allow us to approach a value. So we want this distance to be approaching zero. What is this distance here? What do we call that? H. So we want to look the limit as H approaches zero, or the distance between these two points approaching zero of our function, <clears throat> um, sorry, of our slope, right? Because we want to know the slope of our tangent line. We're taking that slope of those two points where the point's getting closer and closer and closer. And again, we have them up here, our slope of that line is going to be. All right, so we have f of x plus h minus f of x. Now, what do you notice happens on the bottom? Yeah, the x's cancel. We're left with just h. So this will actually tell us our instantaneous rate of change, the slope of that tangent line. And this is actually what we call our derivative. All right, so this is our derivative. We'll write that out for me on the next page. And that's one of your big first ideas in calculus, in your big first concepts in calculus. <laughs> so again, let me recap that. Secant line goes through two points. That's not going to give us the exact slope, but that will give us an approximation at least. The closer we all are to the actual point, the closer our slope can be to the actual slope. Now, in order to get that closer and closer, we want to move that point closer to the original, which means our secant line will approach that tangent line. And ultimately, we want the slope of the tangent line. The slope of the tangent will give me my instantaneous rate of change. So in order to do that, we shrink this distance between the two points. So I want my h to be approaching zero, that distance between the two points to approach zero. And as that gets closer to the actual point, then my secant will approach the tangent. So we're taking the limit as um, h approaches zero of our slope equation. In our slope equation, I mean just from slopes. OK, questions with this before we formally write out our limit definition? So again, derivative is the slope of the tangent line. 
Um, and it's that instantaneous rate of change, which is big. All right, so our limit definition of a derivative. <laughs> So our derivative, the notation for it is f prime of x. And we'll talk about some other notations for it, but this is probably, uh, well, I don't know what the most common is, but this is one of the more common ones. Okay, so this is derivative here. Derivative of f. Derivative of f. Okay, so the derivative is defined, the definition is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Again, the idea that that distance between the two points is not enough. All right, now there's another alternate definition. So f prime of a. <clears throat> so this first one is the derivative of the function. This gives back to us a function. Okay, so for example, if we have the function f of x equals x cubed, the derivative is 3x squared. This fits back the function. This here is the derivative at a point. So this is the derivative of f of x at the point x cubed. Okay, so this is at a point. This is just the general derivative function. All right, so we have the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. So the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. It's still the same concept. Just instead of saying x and x plus h, we call this x and a. So this is f of x, this is f of a. And again, we're saying as x approaches a. So as we have this approach in the point body there. So again, as our slope is approaching the tangent. All right. So these are the two biggies. In calculus, we do not have a formula sheet. So we need to put these to memory. Um, and we'll be working with you quite a bit. So with this, we're going to use this to actually figure out the derivative. Now, some of you, I know, have learned some derivative rules last year. But right now in calculus, you're going to act like you don't know what those rules are. Okay, so I do want you to actually do the limit, specifically when asked for it. Um, we're also going to be using this to identify um, that it is trying to find a derivative. So sometimes they'll give you an expression where it says limit is h approaches zero of some expression. They ask you to identify what function are they talking about and what point are they referring to. So you have to be able to recognize that when you see this, this means, hey, they're doing the derivative. Okay. So you'll be able to use it and recognize that and just find the derivative. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, let's write out a little bit more notation for derivative. So derivative, we said f prime of x is a big notation. Um, the, we also have an y prime. Obviously, if it's h of x, h prime of x. Um, if it's k equals k prime. The other biggie is dy dx. This is saying the derivative of y with respect to x. That simply means y is our function and x is the variable that we're dealing with. Um, some other notation you might see is the derivative with respect to x of our function f of x. You'll see this notation used when they don't define the function as f of x. They just put the expression in there rather than saying f of x. Um, but these are the most common. Okay, so that's notation you'll see for derivative. And again, derivative is your instantaneous rate of change, your I rock. Instantaneous rate of change, which is the scope of the tangent line. Okay, I'm going to keep harping that idea. Um, those ideas are because they're very, very good. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at how we can actually find the derivative. Find the derivative of f of x equal to 3x squared minus 7. 
and find f prime of negative 2. Okay, so first I want us to find the derivative, the general derivative f prime of x. So we're going to have a function. Then once we have found it, we're going to actually evaluate that derivative at negative 2. So we're going to find out what is the slope at the exact point of x equal to negative 2. Now, you can actually use either limit definition. Uh, when you're looking for the general derivative, it's more common to use the h definition. When you're looking for it at a specific point, it's more common to use this. But you can actually use either one. Uh, we're going to go and use h1 to start off with. All right. So our derivative, f prime of x, again, this means derivative, is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all h. <laughs> Same set of numbers. All right. So let's go ahead just off to the side. I'm going to go ahead and do some work with my f of x plus h and f of x. That way I don't have to rewrite it over and over again. All right, f of x plus h. I'm just simply taking x plus h put it incorrect. So I have 3 times x plus h on the square root by itself. <laughs> and then we're going to go ahead and simplify this. Why am I not able to do the limit right here? Why can't I just do direct substitution be done? What happens? Turn to your shoulder partner, what happens when we substitute in h for 0? Or 0 for h? All right, go ahead and bring it back up front. What happens if you take zero and put it in for H? Sean, you just said it to your photo partner. I'm not that scared. What happens? Yeah, we get zero for zero. We get F of X minus F of X, F of X which is zero. Zero. So we have to do something more. We talked about we have factors, we have multiple effect conjugates, we have common denominators to find that way. So we're trying to do something else. Here, let's go ahead and just substitute it into our function and see if we can simplify it there and cancel out with that h so that we can actually evaluate it. Alright. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and simplify this out. So we have 3 times this is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 7. Okay, so again, x squared, xh, h x, so that gives us your 2xh. If you need to write that out to the step off side, that's fine. I'm just trying to say. <coughs> and let's go to shoot that 3. So 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared plus 7. Alright, and let's go ahead and take this and put it back to our function. This is our x plus h. Okay, so this is okay. So our limit as h approaches 0. I'm going to go ahead and write it in blue there. So 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared minus 7. So that was just this piece. I'm going to go and put that in parentheses. And then we have minus f of x, and f of x is just 3x squared times 7, 3x squared times 7, all over h. Alright, questions so far? Okay. So I'm going to want to distribute this negative sign there, and when I do You guys okay if I skip a couple steps with this one? I get negative 3x squared plus 7. Are you guys okay with that? So I'm going to write above the top. This is bad notation. But we end up getting negative 3x squared plus 7. So what happens with my 3x squared? What happens with my 7s? Okay, so what can I simplify? <laughs> 6xh plus 3h squared over h. Alright, 
right, it's smaller and easier to work with, but if I try and put it in zero, I still get zero over zero. What can I do now? Back drop the h, divide by the h, however you want to go about it. All right, so if I reduce each one by factor of h, um, so again, you can rewrite this as h times 6x plus 3h over h. But if you're able to recognize that you just reduce each of those h's by 1, that's fine. The limit is h over to 0 of 6x plus 3h. Now I have a direct substitution. Woo, yes, we can. <coughs> I do drag substitution, I get 6x plus oh, 3 times 0. So really our answer is... So what was that we found? Let's go back up because we should all have equal signs showing what we're doing here. Oh, f prime of x. We were finding our derivative. That's great. Make sure you have that notation, f prime of x. If you say f of x equals, that's wrong. You're saying that the function equals that. Our function is not 6x. Our derivative is 6x. So this is my derivative function. What this does is it tells me my instantaneous rate of change, my slope of the tangent line at any point in time along this function. So I could graph this function and choose any point and say, okay, at x equals to 2.835. What's the slope of the tangent line? Say 2.835, put it in here, it tells me my slope. Okay, so we found our derivative. It says then find f prime of negative 2. Right. Now, we have a couple of ways we can do this piece. f prime of negative 2, that's the derivative at a point, right? We have an equation for that, the derivative at a point. But didn't we just find the derivative? So let's just use the derivative. We could do this, but since we know the derivative, let's just go ahead and use it, say we're still here. So f prime of negative 2, 6 times negative 2, which is negative. All right, so f prime of negative 2. So on the graph, if I were to look at my original graph and go to the point where x equals negative 2 and draw my tangent line, the slope of that tangent line would be negative 12. It's a pretty steep negative slope. Okay. Questions with that? All right, so what you'll notice with our limit definition of the derivative is it's not difficult, it's just tedious. But the good news is that after we do our limits and we learn our derivative rules, you don't have to do the limit definition as well. All right, let's go take a look at another one. <coughs> All right, find the equation of the tangent line. Find the equation of the tangent line. start off with that. Now, in your previous years, you learned three ways to write an equation of line. Slope intercept form, standard form, and point slope form. You can use any of those three in count, but honestly, the easiest one to use is point slope form, because they don't require you to simplify it into point slope form. So use point slope form, and then you're done. You don't have to simplify, you don't have to distribute anything like that. So we're going to use point slope form. So if y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. This is my point slope form. This is what we're going to use. To write the equation of a line, here's an equation of y. All right, I need two things for my equation of line. I need a point, and I need the slope. Well, I have my point that was given to me. Now I need to find my slope. 
So I need the slope. This is the equation for the tangent line. So I need the slope of the tangent line. Wait a second. What gives me the slope of a tangent line? The derivative. So looky there. We have to find the derivative. In order to find their slope of the tangent line, I need to have the derivative. So slope of the tangent line, which means derivative. And that's why we have to use the limit definition of the derivative here. All right? So let's go ahead and do that. So I need to know what my derivative is. <clears throat> now, do I need to know the entire derivative or just at that point? We just need at that point. We could find the entire derivative. Great. Do the work for it. But I only need the derivative at this point because that's all I need for my equation of the y. So you can find the entire general derivative if you wanted to and do your h definition, but it's not necessary. We can go ahead and just do the derivative at a point. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and use our derivative at a point. Same idea, it's just f of x and f of a. All right, so let's go ahead and rewrite that. So f prime of a. I'm going to rewrite out the definition here. Is the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Okay, so this is what we're going to use. Now, we want the derivative at 4. Right? This is where we want to find our derivative x. So for this particular problem, I want to know f prime of 4. Great. So the limit as x approaches, instead of a, 4, as x approaches 4, f of x minus f of 4 over x minus 4. Okay, so now we just have to do some simplifying here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of work off to the side. Although, what is this? Just square root of x? Nah, we don't need to do the work. We can do that math in our head. All right. <coughs> so the limit as x approaches 4. What's my function again? Square root of x. So it's a square root of x. And then I want f of 4. So square root of 4, which is? Over x minus 4. Okay. So we have x approaching 4. If I try to do 4 and put it directly in, then I'm going to get 0 to 0. Thoughts as to what we can do with this? How can I manipulate this to get it so that um, <coughs> so that something simplifies? What can I do? Multiply by the conjugate. So let's go ahead and do that. All right. So I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. Now let's do some work off to the side. All right. So I have square root of x minus 2 x minus 4. Like you guys said, let's multiply by the conjugate. Square root of x plus 2 over square root of x plus 2. top, we get x minus 4. On the bottom, let's leave that not multiplied out. And glory be, these reduce. Oh, that's good. So I have the limit as x approaches 4. This reduces down to 1 over square root of x plus 2. I'm going to pause to make sure everyone's with me because I was writing over there. So. Can we do direct substitution? Yay! All right, let's do direct substitution. Notice I've been writing my limit all along because I have not evaluated, but I'm about to evaluate, so no longer writing the limit. I'm going to take 4, substitute it in, I get 1 over square root of 4 plus 2. What does that simplify down to? 1 4. Good. What was that that we found? Oh, yeah. That was f prime. And my prime keep merging with my f's there. <clears throat> okay, so we found the derivative at 4 is 1 4. Why were we doing that? What does that tell us? Good. So again, this is the slope <coughs> of the tangent line. At x equals 
And that's what I needed to finish out my equation. So now I can assemble it all together into my equation of the tangent line. And my equation of the tangent line, y minus y1. My y coordinate was 2. Y minus equals my slope of that tangent line. It's 1 fourth times x. I'm just going to come back on this. x minus our x coordinate, and our x coordinate was 4. And again, in AP calculus, you do not have to simplify that. You can just leave it in point slope form. And I ask that you don't simplify it because you might make a simple silly mistake, but you get it wrong get it wrong if you lose your question. Okay, questions with that? Alright, so again, what's happening here is that we have this function square root of x. And we know what that graph looks like. Something like this. And they want us to write the equation of the tangent line at the point four two. So, let me redraw this so it's a little better. This is the point we're interested in. And what we just found was that equation of the tangent line. So if I want to draw my tangent line. What we found down here at the bottom is that equation. So we should see a pretty shallow slope as we see it is shallow, it's a slope of 1 4. Um, and then as you would multiply it out, you would get that y Okay, questions on that? Okay. Let's take a look at this next one. So that's what it's saying. We have, hey, this is a derivative, but it's also being evaluated at a certain number. So to, evaluate, to decide what our function is, we want to pretty much look at this first piece here. This is the idea of x plus h. So my function here is just this quantity to the fourth, or x to the fourth. So if it was x plus h, we would have had x plus h to the fourth. If we're looking at 3, 3 plus h to the fourth. So when we're looking to identify our function, we look at this first piece here, and pretty much this you just replace with x. So wherever it's a number plus h, you just replace with x. So this is our function. And we're looking at the point 
x equal what. So we have to figure out what x value has been substituted. Again, pretty much whatever number is there instead of x is your value. So x equal 3. And to double check that you did this correct, remember your function, or your, your limit here, says f of x plus h minus f of x. So if I were to take 3 and put it in, what is 3 to the fourth power? 81, which is indeed what we have. Okay. So this is a type of multiple choice problem that you'll often see in the AP exam, where they present you with that limit and they ask you what that represents, or ask you what it equals. And so what it actually is, is our derivative, we're looking to find the derivative of f of x, and our f of x is x to the fourth. So what this is telling us is it's saying f prime of, whoops, not four, three, f prime of three. This represents the derivative at three. But what's the function we're working with? This is the function we're working with. This is the value. They just simply ask us to state the function and the value. Later on, once we learn our derivative rules, you'll have to actually evaluate the derivative. Now we could go through and multiply that all out and everything and find the derivative that way. But for right now, we're just identifying it. Okay, questions on how to identify that one? Okay, so let's go and try another one. The limit as x goes to 4. The square root of x minus 2 over x minus 4. Okay, so for this one, you'll notice it's a different look at definition. It's not the h1, it's actually our x approaching a. So same idea though, we still want to identify what the function is and what value we're looking at. These ones are sometimes a little bit easier because if remember, the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. We just simply look here to find what our f of x is. The function we're looking at is square root of x. And then to know what my a value is, looking at, at x. So again, if I were to do f of a, take 4, substitute in square root of 4 is 2. So those ones are actually a little bit easier to identify. <laughs> um, because 3 was substituted for x, so normally it's x plus h. Instead of x plus h, we have 3 plus h. Also, instead of f of x, we have 3 actually substituted in, so 3 to the fourth, which is the Other questions? Right, so you have your homework in front of you. Day four homework. Um, please do this on a separate sheet of paper. Please do not try to squeeze it in on the paper. Uh, if it's a problem where asked you to draw on the graph, you can see that on the paper. So remember, the factor is simplified, times get simplified, times common denominator. And you'll use that limit definition over and over and over. Any questions?